Testing, testing. Can you hear me? Testing, testing. Can you hear me? Testing, testing. Okay. Can you hear me? Right here? Maybe. Okay. Um, did all of you see the updated calendar for the class? Yes. Great. So basically today we're going to do chapter 10. We're going to just briefly look at chapter 11. Um, if your OCHEM 2 professor starts at chapter 12, you're responsible for learning chapter 11. But you'll see chapter 11 is really pretty um, in line with chapter eight, actually. There's not a ton of extra stuff you have to do for chapter 11. Um, and for most of you, your OCHEM 2 class will actually start at chapter 11. So for most of your, you, you should be in good shape. Um, especially, I, oh. Oh, I know Dr. Berhe's uh, class starts at at chapter 11. And for those of you who are taking summer two with him, that should be fine. Um, okay, and then also chapter nine, same thing. If your OCHEM 2 professor holds you responsible for learning chapter nine, really the best way to learn chapter nine is to actually do NMR spectroscopy and IR spectroscopy ad nauseum. But not, not all of you will be required for that, especially if Dr. Berhe is your OCHEM 2 professor. It'll just be bonus points on your finals. So again, you're responsible for learning that on your own. If And there's resources available on my YouTube. That's basically the same lecture I would have given in class if you need that. Um, OK, and then also your grades are up. So Canvas is a really bad grade book. And because I do so many bonus drops, swaps, whatever, Canvas is really bad at calculating your grade for you. So ignore the Canvas grades. So at the very, like, all the way over on the right, you know, it'll have, like, on your grades, like, oh, this is what your total grade is. That's not correct. Canvas does not like to let me drop and add bonus and do this, that, the other. So I actually take all your grades off Canvas and in an Excel sheet that I have a lot more control over, I will add all of the bonus points. I will do your drop grade. And then eventually I'll do the replacement grade for um, if your final is higher than one of your exams. So I uploaded last night new columns in Canvas that say like exam average with drop, quiz average with drop, participation average. Those are the numbers you want to go by. I think the homework average is actually right. 
because it'll end up being five homework grades because we split up eight and 10. Actually, you could just add up the total out of 20 or add up the total and it'll be out of 100 because there's five times 20 is 100. So um, your homework grade should be pretty easy to calculate. So to calculate your grade, you could just multiply each one of those by the percentage that it's worth. So like 0.25 if it's worth 25% or multiply by 0.3 if it's worth 30% or whatever and add those up. And then you still have 15 points possible for your overall grade on the final. So that's how you can kind of figure out what you can expect. Any questions on grade calculations? The ones that I put up there have accounted for any bonus up to this point, but they have not accounted for like the um, office hours or the extra credit essay. Okay. Great, so what do you guys know about um, radical reactions? Who watched the video I put up over the weekend? Oh, great. So what um, what's the first step of a radical reaction? Happens in three steps. Initiation, and then what's the second step? Propagation, and last, termination. That's right. So this is actually true for both radical reactions, but also polymers. Um, and polymers are everywhere and they do everything like plastics or polymers. Um, and to make a lot of polymers, they follow the same thing so that the polymer reaction will just keep reacting in the propagation step until you get a really long molecule. Polymers are just like repeating chains of the same molecule over and over and over again. I like to describe it like a necklace, like a beaded necklace. The beads are the individual molecules and they repeat over and over and over to get the whole polymer chain. Okay, so um, for the initial step, what happens is a radical is generated. So if you have Br2 or Cl2, especially these are sensitive to light. And light is usually represented as H nu. They're also sensitive to heat. So if you ever, I don't think they do this anymore, but if you're young enough to remember when they use like iodine on cuts, it would always come in a dark amber bottle. That would be so that you could try to keep it out of the light so that the iodine wouldn't break up into two iodine radicals. So if you expose it to light or heat, it will generate a homolytic cleavage, which is different than we've seen in a while, where a bromine will have a radical on each side. And this is something I'm going to be grading for in your homework. If I see double-headed arrows to indicate the way that radicals are moving, I'm not going to give you full credit for that. Radicals don't move in double-headed arrows. You can't show the movement of one electron with a double-headed arrow. Okay, so uh, if you expose either, these are the main ones that you'll see because fluorine is like super, super crazy reactive and iodine doesn't react as quickly. So mostly when we use radical reactions, we use bromine or chlorine and you'll get two radicals that form with the homolytic cleavage. Um, and usually these are gonna be used, I should have said this at the beginning. The biggest reason that radical reactions are used is to turn alkanes into halogens. So, or halo alkane. So if you have a plain old alkane and you wanna do a reaction with it, there's not a whole lot of reactions this can do, but you can functionalize it by adding an alkane with a radical reaction, or a, sorry, a halogen with a radical reaction. So it makes this functional for use by adding a functional group, right? Okay, so propagation is any way that the radical can keep itself going. Usually, if you add a radical into um, a reaction flask with a bunch of other things, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's radical, so it's trying to react with other things. It's radical. It's like out there causing trouble. That's, you know, the term radical in real life is very similar to the term radical in the chemistry world. And if you've heard of free radicals, like, and that's why we need to have antioxidants. That's actually real. There are free radicals that form in your body that's an unpaired electron that's causing damage to your cells. And that can cause your cells to die. It can cause aging. And it even, I think those can be part of what contributes to um, cancerous cells. So antioxidants actually are, is very cool. Antioxidants are structures with a lot of resonance so that radical is spread around through the whole antioxidant 
instead of being focused in one area so it does less damage right because instead of one full electron in one area it's spread out okay so um <clears throat> Propagation step is anything that keeps the radical going. So if you put it, for example, in a flask with, we had our Br2 and we have our alkane, it will try to find a hydrogen that it can steal and it will form a bond, but the radical will keep going. So that's one propagation step. Another possible propagation step it doesn't really give us what we want, but is this bromine can react with another bromine and form a new bromine radical. So that still would be a propagation step, even though there's no net change because the interaction of the bromine with something else generates a new radical. So anything that generates, keeps the radical generating itself is a propagation step. So I should have put termination down at the bottom because I, ran out of space. So all these are propagation steps. And then termination is any two radicals finding each other. So if you have this radical and this radical, they can find each other and you get a halogenated alkane. For some reason I found, don't feel intimidated if you don't feel this way, but I found that students really like this chapter and then it just kind of makes sense to them. Something about the initiation, propagation, termination step is just very, very intuitive. I don't know why actually. Um, one thing is that usually, yes. The bromine itself is going, so that would form HBr. Sorry, I should have drawn. It forms HBr in this radical. So basically, the bromine has this around it, and it takes the hydrogen here. Let's make this be a little different. That was a good question. So say this is the original step that we have. This electron will join up it steals an electron from right here and so there's one of these electrons left behind from this bond but the atom goes and forms a bond between the h and the br that was a good question but because by that combination it's not two radicals meeting each other it's one radical stealing something else and leaving behind a radical that's why it's considered a propagation step so the radical finds another radical to combine with, but it's leaving in a radical behind. Okay. Any questions on that? So the radical that's going to be formed when um, any like bromine, chlorine, or whatever reacts is it's going to prefer, especially with bromine, the most stable radical that it can leave behind. So you'll notice here on this alkane, the radical could have formed anywhere, but I put it at the tertiary because just like with, um, I don't know why this is blurry, just like with carbocations, tertiary radicals are the most stable. They follow the same stability rules as carbocations. Um, Chlorine is slightly less selective, so it won't always give you a higher percentage of the most stable, but bromine usually will. Okay, so this is an overview of radical reactions. Before we get into the notes, I want you to try, and you can simplify it down. Um, you don't have to draw all the possible propagation steps, but I want you to try to draw each of these steps. And I want you to focus on using single barbed arrows. So start with bromine being uh, reacted to light. I'm gonna do H nu for light. It looks like HB, but that's H nu. And then have it react with, I'm just gonna do a very simple uh, propane and the most stable radical will be the secondary. So that plus whatever's generated here. And then the third step will be two radicals finding each other. So 
So I'll give you that little hint there. So try to work that out.
Okay, how are y'all feeling about this? Maybe? Iffy? Okay, let's do it together. So I'm going to start with the bromine. Uh, that's a little bit easier, I think. So the first step, the initiation. Two bromine radicals form with homolytic cleavage. Make sure you're doing your arrows correctly. Again, I'm going to grade for that on your homework. I want to see the proper curved arrows in your work. And then the propagation step, there's only really primarily one place that the bromine is going to react with on this, um, on this molecule. Which one is it? Is it hydrogen one or hydrogen two? Hydrogen one, because that gives the radical that is able to be stabilized by resonance. So. Yeah, you can still see. On this side, I'm going to draw those two different radicals, like as if it were to go over here. And you can see that a resonance form could happen on this one, where, wait, the radical moved here. The radical is distributed, and you'll notice I'm still doing my single barbed arrows, even on this resonance structure. The radical is distributed all the way around the ring, right? Yes? Yes. Um, this is actually what I mean by it. So that's a good question for this exact moment because I'm drawing it. <laughs> so that that's easy for me to answer. So good question. Good timing. Okay, so the benzylic position is literally the position one away from a benzene. So like right here, if you have a methyl group off of a benzene, that is the benzylic position. Or if it's a long chain, this right here, that's the benzylic position. And that is a very, very stable position because of what I've drawn out here is there's resonance. That's true for a radical, but it's also true for if you have a benzylic carbocation, you still have resonance that distributes this carbocation all the way around the ring, right? Uh, positive charge here. So instead of that positive charge being focused in on one place, or instead of this radical being focused in on one place, it's substituted all the way around the ring. So that position, even though it's just a secondary, it's very, very stabilized by all those resonance structures. So um, that's called benzylic. We also talked about, uh, do you remember the allylic position? Vaguely. I don't think you're probably the only one, so you don't have to look ashamed. You're just the only one who's brave enough to ask. <laughs> so the allylic position is if it's one away from just one double bond, right? So um, this is called the allyl radical or an allyl cation. Allylic, benzylic, and then you'd have the allyl, sometimes they call it the all allyl carbocation or the allyl radical, something like that. That sometimes I guess they could call this benzyl carbocation, benzyl radical, but I don't hear benzyl as much as I hear allyl. So this is also stabilized by resonance, but it's less stabilized by resonance because it only has one resonance structure. So it's good. It's better than just being on a plain old regular secondary position, right? Or primary position. It's, but it's not as good as being on a benzene. Okay, so be, that is the, I think that's actually one of the hardest things about this chapter is you have to remember resonance and how it plays into stabilities. And it's the same as carbocation, but we went so quickly through that chapter, you know, where we talked about carbocations that I feel like basically it came up in chapter seven. We talked about it briefly in chapter eight and now here it is back up again. And so you have to make sure that you can spot just by looking where is the most stable carbocation. And I gave you an exam question that had all those alcohols. And it was like, which of these alcohols would undergo acid ca catalyzed um, dehydration the fastest? And it was basically asking which of these would form the most stable carbocation if the oxygen left. So 
I've been trying to build you up towards this, but you have to basically be able to just look at this alkane and know where's the most stable radical. And I think that can be one of the hardest parts of this chapter, actually. Okay, so um, I agree that this is going to be all that to say. This is going to take uh, the hydrogen at position one. So they will bond and your termination. Oh, no. So your propagation step leaves behind this radical. So we'll say one radical reacted here. The other radical is still present in solution. I drew that arrow bad, but you get the idea. And you get your bromine added at the benzylic position. So um, this is obviously pretty simplified down, right? It's not literally that one bromine molecule breaks up and reacts with one single benzene, and then you get your product. There's probably like six different bromines that have all broken up for every one or, <laughs> you know, for every 10 of your, ben your benzenes over here. And then whichever one happens to run into it first will form the radical. And then there might be another one floating around that will react with it. And that's why these can be difficult to control and why there is the possibility for some pro side products but if you can follow this basic idea, you're going to be able to pretty easily predict what's going to happen overall, what the major product is in a bromination. So this is simplified down version of it. I don't want you to imagine that literally one bromine molecule reacts with one benzene or you know benzylic position or whatever. In a reaction solution, there's a lot more going on. But this is the basic takeaway that you need from this chapter. OK. And then the chlorine starts out the same way. We get our, oh yes. Mm -hmm. Rearrangement is very specific in that it pretty much only happens in um, carbocations when there's a methyl or a hydride that can shift into it. So it's actually not a resonance structure. It's a changing of the constitution of the molecule. So it's a, literally like a constitutional isomer more so than a resonance structure. That's a good question though. Um, but I would say because of that, then you're unlikely, these are resonants. So you want to think about, is it very likely to react where there's a double bond present? Not as much. You don't want to disrupt this whole beautiful, like once this bromine adds in, if it added into over here, that then you've broken a benzene ring. And you don't, want to break a benzene ring ever because benzene rings are really stable so my answer to that question is that's a very good question and it's hard to conceptualize because i think it becomes very intuitive the more you do it but you don't disrupt the chain of resonance usually you generate that radical where it can be stabilized by resonance but you're not worrying about it reacting with other resonance structures and I think it's very rare, like thinking about all the reactions I've ever done actually in a research lab, I can't ever remember there being a benzene ring that got disrupted on accident. Like even when it, something was stabilized by resonance, the benzene structure stays intact. So, yeah. I feel like it probably has to do with what's most energetically favorable. And it's not energetically favorable to break the flow of electrons in that benzene ring. And when you actually add in the bromine, it's like when it's the radical, it's in resonance, it's moving all around. But when the bromine actually attaches, there that takes away that resonance position, right? Like here there's a radical and the radical can keep moving, but this bromine has interrupted your resonance. There's not alternating double bonds there anymore. So I think it's most energetically favorable for the resonance not to be interrupted in the bromine to add over here. 
That was a really good question. That really made me think deeply. I appreciate that. I like those kinds of things that I'm like, oh, let me pull this out of the deep recesses of my brain of why I think about it like that. That's a really good question. So in short, the answer is no. <laughs> it won't uh, react with one of the resonance structurals. It'll go with the um, wherever you put it, that there's an available hydrogen. And it's typically on an sp3 hybridized carbon. It's not usually like it's going to react with the, um, it's not usually going to react on a double bond from what I can think of in a radical reaction. It can, but not in this kind. We usually use it on a alkane wherever possible. And it, again, we'll try not to disrupt the resonance. Okay, so um, on the chlorination step, I'm gonna get rid of this because it's not wrong, or it's not right, it doesn't exist. So the chlorine breaks up the same way and we get our chlorine radicals, but chlorine's a little bit more chaotic. And so it will actually generate a radical at least in two different positions. I would say here and here. Again, I don't think it will mess up the benzene ring. I don't think it will react on the double bond. Um, that would be my inclination anyways, that it wouldn't. Um, and it would do so by abstracting a hydrogen. So this would turn into HCl. And then your other chlorine would combine in a termination step. And so you sort of end up with two major products, two major chlorinations that look like this. And there are other possible side products too, of course, like these two radicals could react with each other and you could get this like crazy structure that looks like this. As a side product, that's definitely possible. There's always a possibility for those kinds of things to happen in a radical reaction but I'm most worried about you knowing where the halogen will add on the alkane. And if you can think critically about what else is going on in solution, I think there might be a question like, which all of these are possible in a halogenation reaction? It has some of those side products, so you'll need to be able to think critically about it. But for the most part, you just are gonna need to be able to predict the, reactant, uh, the reaction. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. You can see the percentages here, like maybe there's a little bit of this uh, primary brom bromination that happens, but it's a lot more rare. And again, stereochemistry rears its ugly head. <laughs> so the hybridization of a radical, uh, radical, an alkane with a radical on it, my brain is not fully functioning today, um, is sp2 hybridized. So it's planar and the radical can add from either side, which means that you will get a mixture of stereochemistry, which is why the um, oxymercuration demercuration it initially adds anti and then your reduction actually goes through a radical mechanism and it causes that, um, oh, uh, the mercury, the HDOAC, to be turned into a hydrogen in a radical reaction. So that's why you get the mixture of stereochemistry and the stereochemistry isn't controlled in that reaction. Um, so this is kind of showing you that you can get a racemic mixture if it adds at a position that would generate a chiral center. So this is kind of a tricky one, right? Because there's only one position it can add at to make a chiral center because this middle one is symmetrical. Um, this has two hydrogens on it besides the chlorine. So that's not a chiral center. So there's only one chiral center present, uh, but it will give you a racemic mixture. So you have to consider if this alkane adds or if this halogen adds to my alkane in a way that makes a chiral center, it's gonna give RNS but does it actually make a chiral center? Just like we've had some of that already with the additions of water across the double bond. So stereochemistry rears its ugly head. This is just kind of showing you if you can picture it at the um, orbital level that there is this single barbed arrow represents a single electron. 
And you've seen that before. Remember when you had to do like the S, P orbitals and you like drew them all out and you would have like one-way arrows? This is the same thing. We're just drawing the movement of those one-way arrows when we use a single barbed arrow in our mechanism. So this is a convention in chemistry that we use single barbed arrows to represent a single electron. And you've seen it before in this setting. You've never drawn it as moving electrons before really. And so this just shows you how you can get a racemic mixture as a result of this kind of chlorination at the molecular level. Okay, and then we already talked about the allyl position being very stabilized um, and that we learned about the allylic uh, carbocation and now the allyl radical. Um, and that is going to be the most stable position, even though it's secondary, if there's a tertiary adjacent, you still are preferentially going to choose the one with the um, resonance. And I do want to draw attention to this. So you've learned how to react an alkene with a BR2 before. It adds in an anti-position going through the brominium ion. Um, it's in CCL4 and there's no heat or light as part of the reactants. Or you can have Br2 and usually the solvent isn't mentioned and it will say H nu or it will say heat. And that's how you know that it's going to give you a radical bromination over um, adding two bromines to an alkene, right? So this, I think, um, as you're going through your final, and I have that practice final that I posted, how many of you guys took a practice final yet? A few of you. Okay, so as I'm going through the practice final, you'll see me look at the reagents and uh, on the video and I'm like, okay, is this an acid base reaction? No. Is this a substitution elimination reaction? No. And then I get to the alkenes and I'm like, is this an addition reaction? And if it's just bromine in some kind of solvent, CCL4 or methanol or water, I'm like, oh, this will form a halohydrin or this will add two bromines to my double bond. But if it's bromine with heat or light, that's an indication to me that it's a radical reaction. So when I'm looking at a list of practice problems and I don't for sure know what chapter they're from, like when you do your chapter 10 practice problems, it will be easy. They will all be radical reactions, right? But on your final, they won't all be radical reactions. And you have to know, is this bromine trying to get me to go halohydrin? Is it trying to add two bromines across a double bond or is it a radical reaction? And you can look for clues that will tell you which one it is. So if it's a lower temperature or if temperature is not mentioned and it's just bromine and or chlorine and CCL4, that's how you know it adds anti with the bromidium ion across the double bond, or if there's water or methanol, the halohydrin would form. But if it does mention heat, if it mentions temperature, if it says like a really small concentration of that thing, um, then you can know the, uh, the radical reaction will occur. This is kind of showing you, see how it says like 400 degrees, then we get our radical uh, allylic position. So this just sort of goes through that again. I'm going to skip ahead. I didn't get a chance to redo these slides, but I want to skip ahead to where we get into. Ah, here we go. You don't always have to use Br2 with heat and light because halogens um, can be so reactive. You might not want to keep a bottle of bromine or chlorine on your shelf. So there's another reagent that we sometimes use called NBS or n bromosacinamide. If you react that with light or hydrogen peroxide, it's just another way to generate a bromine radical. So you might see a reduction of an alkane with NBS or um, it'll say NBS or it'll have this structure drawn out with light or peroxide and that will generate your bromine radical. So a lot of times when they're drawing the mechanism of this, you don't have to worry about how the bromine radical is formed because it's not, um, it doesn't go through the same initiation step that you're used to, but it does go through the same propagation steps that you're used to and termination step. Um, 
It's a solid, whereas uh, BR2 and CL2 are liquid or even in the gas state a lot of times at room temperature. So um, it gives you a good amount of your bromine radical without being as reactive because it's solid. It's just basically easier to control. This is, again, one of those things that if you think about this in real life in the lab, I don't always want a bottle of bromine sitting on my counter, but a small amount of this MBS solid can generate radicals in a safer, easier, more controlled way, basically. So that's why this exists. And that's why you have to learn about it is because it's an easier way to generate radicals. It's more safe, but it'll still give you the same type of um, products. It doesn't change anything. It's just a different way that you can think of to generate your bromine radicals. And you can go through the same mechanism. Okay, we already talked about how these are stabilized by um, resonance. The allyl radical is good. The vinyl, do you remember us talking about the vinylic carbocation not being good? That's when the um, carbocation is right on that double bond. It's not as stable if it's one away because it can't participate in resonance. Same thing with radicals. The radical doesn't want to form right there on the double bond because it can't participate in resonance. It's not very stable. So the vinylic radical is not going to preferentially form. Again, allylic or benzylic is even better, is better than tertiary, better than secondary, better than primary, is better. All of those are better than the vinylic position. So never draw, never ever in your life, draw a radical reaction happening where the bromine gets added on an sp2 hybridized. It's not gonna happen. Okay. Um, and then also benzylic, we already talked about that. The benzylic carbocation and the benzylic radical are going to be the most stable forms of that because they can participate in resonance. So both of these are considered the benzylic position, whether or not there's a long chain or just one methyl group. Either way, if it's one away from the hydrogen. Um, and that will preferentially form the radical right there because it's the most stable. I don't think, you don't need to know this name. This is sometimes called toluene. This was the first thing I ever used in a chemistry lab and it smelled so bad. Like the weird cleaning products that they use at a women's restroom in a park. You know how that has like a very specific smell? I don't know if the men's restroom smells like that. I don't go in those. But the women's restrooms in parks smell really weird. And toluene smells just like that. And I was like, Whoa! but I shouldn't have been smelling it anyway because I'm pretty sure that it's a carcinogen, but what can you do? Okay. Um, and then this kind of shows you that you can, uh, you won't, even though it'll continue to halogenate, you won't get any on the benzene ring itself, kind of like the question we talked about earlier, but you'll just keep getting more radicals forming right there at the, uh, at the benzylic position because it's so much stabler. Stabler? More stable. So you don't want to interrupt the benzene ring. That won't happen. Um, and then it just shows you how much quickly and more stable this benzylic radical will form than one on the primary one away, because there's resonance here, but there's no resonance here. Okay, and this is the, uh, the long-awaited, how do you use a radical reaction to get anti-Markovnikov addition of an acid HBr or HCl? That question came up briefly in chapter eight. And I was like, no, I'm not gonna make you just memorize this. We're gonna wait till we learn the mechanism. Here it is, the mechanism. Before we do this mechanism, I want you to remember the old mechanism because it's been a week. So. <clears throat> I'm gonna draw this out. What's the very first thing that happens in this reaction? Mm -hmm. Air from the double bond going to the hydrogen. So the bromine basically attacks the electrophilic, or bromine, gosh. The alkene attacks the electrophilic portion of this acid and you get almost your radical. You get your hydrogen adding on this side because uh, it follows what rule? When the hydrogen adds to the less substituted side and the carbocation goes to the more substituted, what's that called? Markovnikov's rule. So it follows Markovnikov's rule 
You also get your BR minus, and then your BR minus will attack, and you end up with um, adding bromine right there across the double bond, right? So we talked very briefly, I didn't want you to memorize this, I just made you aware that this existed, about the fact that you can use a radical reaction mechanism to add HBr anti Markovnikov. So this traditional way with acid and no peroxide gives you Markovnikov product, but I'm about to show you how to get the anti Markovnikov product. So do you see the difference between those two products? Okay, so in the textbook, chapter eight is like, memorize this. And I was like, you don't have to, but now I want you to understand the actual mechanism of what happens. Okay, we're getting close. Yeah. Okay, so anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr. Um, if you add peroxide, you it's called the peroxide effect. You can get this anti-Markovnikov addition. If you um, do HBr with the carbocation, you get primarily the Markovnikov's rule. But if you add it in the presence of peroxide, because peroxide is a radical generator, right? Talked about that. If you have a bottle of hydrogen peroxide, it'll break down, form radicals, and it can become explosive. Not at the concentrations in your house, but in the lab. So this peroxide gener or this radical generator that peroxide has will make this reaction go via a radical reaction mechanism. So you'll get your initiation step. So you get a radical formation, um, and then that will generate a bromine radical which will then go by the same mechanism basically that we talked about before, where the bromine, it's gonna steal from the double bond and leave a radical on the tertiary position. And then a hydrogen will react with that to get you your final product. So it preferentially, it, it's kind of weird because it almost feels like it still goes by Markovnikov's rule because it's generating the Morse table radical, not the more stable carbocation. But the bromine adding is what adds the radical, so that's why it goes by anti-Markovnikov. So basically, it still follows the rule where it's generating the most stable thing, but your bromine adds before your hydrogen. So you don't need to know the mechanism for this, and I'm not going to require you for my class, and I don't think for Dr. Bear Hayes, I'm not going to require you to know this mechanism. But I wanted you to know why it follows anti Markovnikov's rule. It's not like you throw some peroxide in there and suddenly all the rules of thermodynamics are thwarted. It's actually basically just that the bromine and hydrogen add out of order via a radical mechanism. So the termination step happens with the most stable radical and the hydrogen adding at the end. So you don't need to know this mechanism. I think it can kind of confuse people on the basic bromination mechanism. So I don't require that you memorize it, but I do now want you to know that if you see HBr in the presence of peroxide, it will add anti-Markovnikov because it's going by a radical reaction mechanism. And for those of you who are curious about the way this mechanism works, you can spend some more time looking at that, but you don't have to. So, if you add in the presence of peroxide, it goes by the more stable secondary radical where the hydrogen is going to add. But if you do it without the presence of peroxide, it goes by the more stable carbocation, and that's where the bromine attacks. So it just slightly changes. I, th I think of it as it changes the order. Like the instead of the hydrogen adding first and the most stable carbocation forming, the bromine adds first and the least the most stable radical forms, and then the hydrogen adds there. So however you want to think of it is fine with me, but I wanted you to know why that happened. I didn't want you to just have to memorize it. But you're not responsible for regenerating that mechanism. In fact, I have no uh, recourse to force you to do so because we're done with fruit response questions. So <laughs> lucky you. <laughs> um, this is just kind of showing you the overall, what we just talked about, that it'll give you the Markovnikov or the anti-Markovnikov product. Okay, so up to that point is what you're responsible for knowing about for this chapter. I do want to expose you to the idea of poly polymerization because polymers are fascinating um, and they play out a lot in everyday life. Like when you toast your bread, that bread is forming a polymer right there on the surface of your bread. That's why it turns brown. It forms polymer, it's called the Maillard reaction. 
Um, most plastic that you interact with is generated in the lab, but it's a polymer. It's a lab generated polymer. Your DNA is a polymer. Uh, proteins are actually polymers. So you have tons of tons of um, polymers in everyday life. But a way that scientists have learned to make their own polymer is they will use a radical reaction to get um, a repeating unit to react over and over and over and just sort of build on itself. So that's what a polymer is. Uh, like I said earlier, it reminds me of a necklace where the repeating units are actually instead of beads, they're like molecular structures. So in this case, the repeating unit is CH2CH2. So using radical reaction, they're able to make CH2 bond to itself over and over again, CH2, 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 CH2. And then you get a really big molecule made up of all those repeating units up to however many you want. And um, that is called a macromolecule. So polymers are macromolecules. Um, and there's a lot of different examples of these. I wish they had, yes, okay, they do have them. So uh, this one down here, CF2, CF2 in a repeating unit is actually Teflon. Teflon, you know, that coats your pans. Teflon itself is said to be safe unless you heat it with no food in it. Um, so don't preheat your nonstick pans because then they will start to break down the polymer and release fumes that are really dangerous. They coated a light bulb with Teflon and put it in a chicken coop and those chickens suffered. So you don't want to do that to yourself. It's especially bad for birds, but it's not great for humans either. But also the people who invented Teflon did a bunch of really sketchy stuff where they dumped carcinogenic molecules on a farmer's land. So not only do you have to worry about the actual product you're using, but you have to think about how ethical the science was that developed it. I guess you don't have to, but I want you to think about that. Because I think we think of like, I tend to think, oh, there's all these amazing things that science has created. And that is so true. But Organic synthesis is not like a super environmentally friendly process. Like consistently, I evaporate solvents that have halogens in them. And so do you when you use dichloromethane in the lab, right? And so you're putting halogens up into the atmosphere where it will react with heat and light and form radicals and mess up the ozone layer. So there is a cost to our technology that I think it's important for us to recognize, although it does significantly improve our life there's also some negative drawbacks that come from it also all this is allegedly dow was sued and i don't remember i think they settled so i don't think i can legally say that they did it but they did it allegedly um so these are just some other ones that you've seen uh polymethyl methacrylate is actually is it that one there it's there's one that complete it might be polyacetate that they a lot of teams will make glasses out of now instead of glass because it completely blocks out UV light. So it lets visible light in so we can see, but it protects your eyes from the sun um, because it blocks out UV light. It's so weird. You can hold these glasses up under UV light and like it looks like it's a solid wall. But if you put it under visible light, you can see through them. Um, and then polystyrene styrene is usually for styrofoam cups and stuff like that. Part of why it's so hard to break down polymers is because these are actual bonds. They're not intermolecular forces that are holding this thing together, right? So you've generated a huge molecule held together with a bunch of bonds. Whereas most of our like solids and liquids are individual molecules that are held together with um, intermolecular forces. But this is a huge molecule that's held together with actual bonds. So it can be hard to break down. Although there is a bacteria that was found naturally growing outside of a water bottle plant that could break down the plastics naturally with its own gut enzymes. Like it was living off of plastic. That's crazy. They're making progress. Okay, so that's it for chapter 10. It's a pretty straightforward chapter. The biggest thing is to know those main steps. Know that uh, chlorine is going to react more than bromine. I actually think I might in the chapter 10 practice problems, there's one question with chlorine that I think I just picked the most stable, and I think that that was wrong. So look out for that mistake. I'll try to go find it and fix it. I meant to do it last semester, and I didn't. <clears throat> and then, so chlorine's more reactive than bromine. Bromine will always pick the most stable radical. Chlorine will give you a mixture of products. If there's symmetry, it'll give, like, the one that's most frequently occurring. And then um know that the hydrogen peroxide with hbr will result in anti-markovnikov addition 
So what I want to do now is take a quick break. And then when we come back, I'll open it up for questions about chapter 10, and then we'll just touch on chapter 11. Okay. So see me back here at 1216. <clears throat> This isn't what I wanted.
Yes. Mm -hmm. With a uh, with a benzene. It could, so this HCl could definitely bump into another radical and form H2 or form HCl again a different way or form Cl2. So there's definitely different ways that the um, propagation could happen, but you're. I don't think you'll be responsible for knowing that on your final. Like you might reason your way through it on, I think there's like one or two of your homework questions that are like that that you should be able to reason your way through relatively easily for like side products, but I'm not going to expect you to be like, here's all the side products that could possibly form. That's kind of outside the scope. And <clears throat> I just want you to kind of have the basics down for radical reactions. Anything else? Yes. Um, sometimes, okay, I think what has probably happened is sometimes the professor I got this for doesn't have like just the practice problems without the answer key. So, um, I will just go in and delete all these, or if you don't want to wait for me to do it, you can just go in and delete it on your own. I was going to see if I could find one like that, where it's like, which of these would be all the possible different propagation steps, but I don't, I'm pretty sure there's, maybe there's not. Anyway, it's pretty straightforward. You should be able to do most of these already, the radical part. And then what I like about these practice problems that helps your review for your final is there's also a lot of chapters um, seven and eight involved in there, right? So um, like this has a radical reaction followed by, so you generate a good leaving group, followed by a weak nucleophile and heat being added. So what would happen if you have a weak nucleophile, heat, and a good leaving group? An E1 reaction. Heat always goes towards uh, elimination, and if it's a weak nucleophile, it's going to favor one over two. So that can be a way for you to review for your final as you're doing these types of questions is what would happen if you have that. And this one, there's no heat, but there's only a weak nucleophile. So what do you think that one does? S and one, yeah. So this will help you. And then also you have to account for Zaitsev versus Hoffman product. So this will help you, I think solidify a lot of especially chapter six and seven and be a review, but there also is some of eight in there as well. Um, I think sometimes it'll do an elimination and then add stuff to it. This in eight and three, I don't think you need to worry about that. We haven't done that yet. But yeah, here you go. There's some chapter eight in there as well. So you got all kinds of goodies waiting for you in the chapter 10 homework and the radical reaction is like barely part of it. <laughs> so it's a really good thing for you to use as a tool to review for your final, which is part of why I also was fine pushing it back to be due this week. Okay, um, but yeah, I'll go in and take out those answer keys. If, especially if you email me and remind me, that would be helpful um, because I am forgetful. But if not, you can delete them on your own as well. Any other chapter 10 questions? Okay. Great. So let's just look briefly at chapter 11. I just want to show you, like draw some of the connections with chapter 11 that, um, that coincide with chapter eight. I'm gonna make this module available. It's not due for you, but if you're not in Dr. Bear Hayes OCHEM 2 class and you're worried that your OCHEM 2 professor might not start at chapter 11, this would be um, valuable for you to like download. And also there's some of uh, my videos that I have about uh, chapter 11 as well on YouTube. So, um, Again, you'll start to see, and we talked about this already some, but you'll start to see in this chap in these next few chapters that you're going to work on creating. Sometimes I'll have nomenclature for it, but creating a functional group. How do we synthesize it? And then reactions of that functional group. How do we react it forward? So chapter 11 is no different than that. It starts with nomenclature of alcohols and ethers and then physical properties and everything. 
how to synthesize alcohols from alkenes, you already know how to do that. You know how to make a halohydrin, which is an alcohol, by adding what to an alkene? How do you make a halohydrin? This is a review for your final. I'm tricking you by making you review for your final while we do chapter 11. What is, how do you make a halohydrin? Halohydrins, when you have a BR on one side and an OH on the other, what do you do to make a halohydrin? What do you add to an alkene? What? BR2 and water. You add bromine and water, and that will give you a bromine on one side and a water on the other. And is that Markovnikov or anti Markovnikov? It's Markovnikov, and does it add syn stereochemistry or anti stereochemistry? It goes through a bridged ion if that helps. It's anti stereochemistry because it does the bridged ion, and then the one comes in and sort of pushes the other one down, similar to an SN2. So that's one way you know how to make an alcohol from an alkene. What's another way you know how to make an alcohol from an alkene? We learned three ways to make a, uh, add water across a double bond, which makes an alcohol. Acid catalyzed hydration is one of them. So if you put an alkene with H plus in water, it will give you an alcohol. Does it add Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? Say it loud and proud. Markovnikov, because it generates a carbocation. That carbocation needs to be stabilized by something. So it'll go to the most stable side, most substituted side. And then your water will attack there. And is it syn stereochemistry or anti stereochemistry? Or both? It's both because a carbocation is formed. So the alcohol can attack from either side of that carbocation, top and bottom. Okay, what's another way that we can make an alcohol from an alkene? Who said it? Oxymercuration, demercuration. And is that Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? It adds Markovnikov and it uh, syn stereochemistry, anti stereochemistry, or both? It does both because it initially adds anti, but then there's a radical step that reduces your um, oxymercury part down to a hydrogen and that is the oxymercury that gets reduced down yeah and then that is now it's gone through a radical step so we know that radical steps screw everything up stereochemically and in the environment okay what's the last way that we learn to add alcohol to a double bond or water across a double bond to make an alcohol there's one more, and it adds anti-Markovnikov, the only one that adds anti-Markovnikov. It's close. I think bromination gets mixed up because bromine and boron sound really similar. It's hydroboration oxidation. Hydroboration oxidation adds anti-Markovnikov. It's the only one that does that. So if you need anti-Markovnikov, that's the one you're going to use. And does it add a syn or anti-stereochemistry? Syn stereochemistry. It's also the only one that you can control the stereochemistry of completely. So those are three ways that you've learned to add um, water across a double bond that basically you can make an alkene turn into an alcohol. Um, the other thing is you can make ethers from those alkenes too. So who remembers what the ether functional group looks like? It's a carbon chain and then an oxygen and then another carbon chain. And we learned that for some of the reactions, there was a way you could tweak them that instead of making an alcohol, you can make an ether. What was that? Who said that? Somebody said something. <laughs> Somebody said potassium permanganate. That will add two alcohols to a double bond or cleave it completely, but it doesn't make an ether yet.
Yes, you can change the solvent on oxymercuration, demercuration, or the halohydrin, and you'll end up with getting, and maybe even hydroboration oxidation, although I'm not sure on that, and you end up getting um, the ether instead. So if you swap out water for alcohol, instead of adding OH, it adds OR. So be sure to pay attention to the solvent. And um, that's a thing that happens a lot on multiple choice questions, is you see the oxymercuration stuff and you're like i know what this does and you don't pay attention to the solvent so make sure that you pay attention to the solvent that it's in so that you get the right answer that's a mistake i make a lot okay so those are how we learn to synthesize alcohols and ethers both from alkenes you already know both of those you also learned at least one reaction of an alcohol can you remember what that reaction of an alcohol is You can start with an alcohol and end up with a double bond. What'd you say? It's a special type of elimination. It's acid catalyzed elimination. If it's a primary alcohol, it goes by um, E2. If it's a secondary tertiary, it goes by E1. Um, the alcohol is turned into a good leaving group, how? How do you turn alcohol into a good leaving group in that acid-catalyzed dehydration? You turn it into water how? That's right. <coughs> you add a hydrogen. So the acid is, serves as a proton to be added to the alcohol group to make it into water so that it's a good leaving group. Okay, what we skipped over in that chapter, but what we're actually going to talk about today that you are going to be responsible for on your final is turning alcohols into good leaving groups other ways. So um, we talked about tosylates and mesylates, and I told you guys you don't have to worry about this just yet. And then we also, uh, we haven't talked about this, but you can also turn alcohols into good leaving groups using PPR3 uh, or SOCl2. So I want to skip ahead to those, uh, to that section real quick. And then the rest of this, I think you've done a lot more of this than you think. If you're teaching yourself this, or even when you're in Dr. Barahay's class, especially on looking for reactions of epoxides, they are very similar to SN1 and SN2. Um, but you already know most of this chapter. As you go through, you'll be like, oh, this is very familiar to me. Okay, let me just scroll down here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can turn alcohols into good leaving groups. I skipped over this in this uh, the earlier chapter because I didn't want it to be too confusing. I wanted you to focus on learning the mechanism, but now that you have the mechanism down of substitution and elimination reactions, um, I'm willing to teach you about how to turn an alcohol into a good leaving group. So um, one major way is using PBR3 and SOCl2. The best thing you can do here is just memorize these. PBR3 and SOCl2 will turn your alcohol into a halogen. Um, that's it. <laughs> that's, that's really the biggest thing that you need to know. I don't think you need to know the mechanism for that, although I wanted to show you, it to you. This is the halogen. So it only works with primary or secondary, but if you have a primary or secondary alcohol, you can add it to PBR3 um, and, or SOCl2. If you add it to PBR3, it'll turn your primary or secondary alcohol into a bromine. If you add it to SOCl2, it'll turn it into a chlorine. Um, I believe it goes by an SN2 mechanism. And so sometimes it can actually, I think it inverts the stereochemistry, but don't quote me on that. It does not form a carbocation. I think it inverts the stereochemistry, but that won't come up on your exam, but you'll need to pay attention to it next time. Um, and then same thing for tosylates and mesylates. If you see a reaction where, um, I think this was on one of your practice tests actually, where it reacts with OTS minus or OMS minus, that basically just converts your alcohol into these big groups, which are very good at stabilizing a negative charge if they leave because they have so much resonance. So because of that, they're very good leaving groups. So if you see OTS, OMS, PCL3, SOCL, wait, PBR3, SOCL2, all of those essentially just convert 
your uh, alcohol into a good leaving group. And you will be responsible for recognizing those on your final. Um, technically it was, we talked about this in chapter six, seven, but I just didn't want you to worry too much about these big structures and be confused. But now that you know what a leaving group is and what it means that alcohol is a bad one and why we might need to convert it, I wanted to introduce you to these ideas. You'll go back over this again with Dr. Berhe. Don't worry about the, um, the stereochemistry of these yet, just know what they do. That's all I'm worried about at this point. Okay, um, that's pretty much all that I wanted to pull out from chapter 11. It's just I wanted you to recognize how much of it you already knew if you're going to have to learn it on your own. And I wanted to remind you as you move forward without me, I'm trying to equip you to learn uh, organic chemistry, not in my classroom, that there are a lot of patterns in organic chemistry. And even like with epoxide reactions, I think you'll see that they're very similar to SN1 and SN2 if you look for it. And I think that that will make them a little bit easier for you. And you already know so much of these things based on um, what we did in chapter eight. Any questions on that? Sorry to just tell you to memorize things, but it's useful. And they come up a ton. If you're gonna take Dr. Richman for OCHEM 2, I think some of you are. Dr. Richman loves to use PCL, uh, PBR3, PCL5 is one, two, SOCL2. He loves to convert alcohols into good leaving groups and then do reactions with the alcohols because it's like one more step to test you on. <laughs> so I want you guys to recognize these before you leave my class and to reinforce that there are a few questions on the final that will use these groups as well. Okay, I wanted to leave some time at the end to open it up for questions. We have about 15 minutes. If you don't have any questions, we can move into the participation questions and then we'll just end a little bit early. Yeah. Uh, well, not necessarily on the arrow. Sometimes I actually think there are some in your practice problem from uh, chapter eight, but it would usually be like you'd have an alcohol and students do kind of get this idea that like if it's above the arrow and below the arrow, like this is the reactant, this is the solvent. That's not always true because uh, sometimes we'll have multi-step questions. So sometimes it'll be like um, TSCL and that's a uh, tosyl chloride or um, NA. OTS is sometimes one that they'll do to have OTS minus come in and replace your alcohol or um, NAOME, uh, not ME, is it for measles? It might be MES. I don't remember off the top of my head. So they might do it like that or they might have the structure drawn out, which it's like for tossel. I think it has a toluene group on it. That's why they call it tossel. And I think this is negatively charged. And for measles, it's just this. So you need to recognize both of those when they come up. Um, but usually that will be your first step. And then your second step will be the reagents that come from an SN1, SN2, E1, or E2, because it's most often used to convert it to a good leaving group. And then once you've converted your alcohol to a good leaving group, you can um, do some kind of substitution or elimination reaction. And that is also a clue that you can use on the exam. If you come into something that you're like, crap, I don't remember this. I don't know what this is doing. And the second step is an elimination or a substitution reaction. You recognize that. But the first step is just like question marks. I don't remember what this is. <laughs> and you don't have a good leaving group. It might be converting your bad leaving group into a good leaving group. So that's kind of like a little hint you can use, a clue you can search for when you're trying to figure out what question is asking. Yeah. I haven't posted them yet. I'm behind. I really wanted to get your grades up before today so that you could um, know basically where you sat going into the final. So I prioritize that over the video keys. Yes, yes, totally. It is on, it's literally on my to-do list to do that today. So it'll definitely happen by tomorrow, <laughs> at least. <laughs> That's it, that was a good question. Yes, I want you to review your old exams for sure. 
Any other questions on this? Okay, take a minute and think about how you felt the day that you started in my class. You very likely knew very little about organic chemistry. I asked you to fill out a little form about how you felt about learning organic chemistry. And a lot of you were like, I'm terrified. I'm so scared. You made it. You know so much more about organic chemistry. I just talked to you about leaving groups and converting leaving groups into something so you can do an SN1, SN2, E1, E2 reaction. And you knew what all those letters and numbers meant for the most part. So even if you feel like you're barely hanging on in this class, you know a lot more than you did when you came into my class. And I want you to be really proud of that because a lot of people don't have the opportunity to learn that and you have, and you've worked hard and you've internalized a lot. And I want you to have the mindset when you're in the final that you're going to show me everything you've learned, not that you're worried about failing on the things that you didn't learn because that's not as useful for you. Okay, participation question for today. I want you to go to that same URL, chem2370q tinyurl.com slash chem 2370q. Oh, wait, or made by O into a Q. Chem 23, ah, uh, tinyurl.com slash chem 2370q. And I want you to tell me um, how you're feeling about learning organic chemistry now. And you can tell me anything else you want me to know, but this is your um, semi-regular semester check-in. Let me give you a few minutes to do that. Do like a minute. Okay, so while you're finishing that up, uh, tomorrow what we're going to do is I took your responses from um, last week's participation question where I asked what you wanted me to go over, and I prioritized those concepts, and I have put together a worksheet for you, and then I've also pulled in some other things that I think will be important for you to review before the final. There will be also some of what we've gone over today. And what's going to happen is I'm going to give that to all of you in your recitation groups. And I want you to work on it together. And the first group who finishes it with everything completely right will get uh, two freebies, two free questions right on their final, where I'll just add two points, like out of 60, I'll add two uh, right answers to you. And the second group that finishes will get one um, question right on the final as well. So you'll get a chance by reviewing before tomorrow <laughs> and learning, starting to learn stuff for your final now to improve your grade on your final tomorrow. So it's 60 questions, I think, total on your final. So you get to add points back if you miss something on your final. For the first person that completes that work, first group that completes that worksheet, completely correct. You have to get all of it right. And that's what we're going to do all day in class on um, Wednesday. And then Thursday, normally we have a reading day. We don't have a reading day in the summer, but we've covered everything that it's imperative for us to cover. So I'm going to make Thursday more like a reading day. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to class Thursday instead of having office hours. And it will be like a two-hour office hour. You guys can ask me any questions you want. 
um, and we will have a review session as a group. So come prepared with questions on Thursday. Okay, so that's our plan for the next few days. Um, I will probably do one more virtual office hour at some point this week, just to be available to you that way, especially since I'm not doing office hours on Thursday, and we'll do an extended office hour in class. Okay, great. Congratulations. You finished OGEM 1. Yay. I'm so proud of you. Connor, I have your homework, or whatever this is, and Lexi, and Amani, and Melissa, and Skyla. I have your work. You already knew. Did you already get your exam? Mm -hmm. I didn't like, make up the quiz. Oh. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Question. So yes. I'm curious about the plan. How can you put food on it if you want to it? It absorbs the heat into the food instead of just letting it heat and heat and heat and heat and heat. The heat then gets transferred off of the pan into the food. So it has to hit a certain temperature for it to start to be dangerous. Okay. You should not preheat Teflon. Okay. I switched to all cast iron. I used to love Teflon, especially for eggs. You have to scrub it so hard after. If you can get a good seasoning on it, which is also a polymer actually, it's just like a self-made polymer, then it's not as bad. If you can get used to them, I think cast irons are worth it and they're safer. 